Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Star Theater. Thank you for coming out this morning. I hope you all enjoyed the tango performances last night. I've, uh, I've had to tap dance my way through a few lectures, but fortunately never had to tango my way through them. So it was just amazing watching those folks. Uh, I'm Jonathan. I'm the resident astronomer here on the uh, Viking Jupiter. Happy to be with you today and talking about a, a, a subject that a, a lot of people ask about. And uh, I think I, when I want to try to ground you in the fact of looking for life outside of the Earth. And uh, we've got here example of actual Earth life and then some hypothetical Earth life. I went to a, when I was in uh, college, went to a lecture at a planetarium and the, the um, professor was talking about life on Jupiter and he put up this slide. This was from Time Life Books. Uh, if you remember those back in the 1960s, they had, this was hypothetical gas bag creatures floating around in Jupiter. And, and he put them up and said, These are, this is a photograph of life on Jupiter. And uh, even though we were freshmen in college, we said, excuse me, I don't think that's actually a photograph of life on Jupiter, but the professor was convinced that it was. I actually know the guy that painted this, this painting, so I was pretty sure it was not a photograph. Uh, I'm going to ask you to do uh, one thing. This is a dangerous thing for a lecturer to do, but the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is close your eyes. Okay, and I'm going to want you to imagine that you're standing on an alien world somewhere. Okay, take a deep breath, close your eyes, clear your mind, picture yourself standing on a planet somewhere. Look up in the sky. How many suns do you see? Is there one like ours? Are there two like Tatooine? More than that? Can you even see the sky? Look down. What are you standing on? Is it rock? Is it sand? Is it ice? Lava? Water? Something else? Is there a lot of gravity? Do you feel heavier than on Earth, or do you feel lighter than on Earth? Can you breathe without a spacesuit? If you take your helmet off and take a deep breath, is there a lot of oxygen, or do you have to pant to get enough air to, to, uh, to breathe? What do you smell? Now look around you. You have to pick up something on this alien world to take back and prove that there's life on this planet. What do you take back with you? So that's the challenge that NASA faces. You can open your eyes now if you're still awake. Okay. I want to thank Judy as, as wearing her Empire Strikes Back t-shirt this morning because this is a perfect lead into the next exercise. So imagine you're sending probe, do probe droids out into the galaxy, okay? So you're, you're on an alien planet now and your scientists have discovered a solar system that looks like it's very interesting to explore and you've managed to convince your government to spend a, a tremendous amount of money on a single probe that's going to be able to go into the solar system and investigate this one planet that you've discovered. So you've got a, a single shot at it, you've spent a long time developing it, it takes a long time for that spaceship to get there. And the spaceship gets closer and sees this, and you start trying to decide where you're going to land now. And so the probe gets ready to take a closer look, and you have to find the best area to land for your one shot at finding la uh, life. And so your probe comes screaming into the atmosphere at 25,000 miles an hour, the parachute pops, and you come down. If you land here, okay, what is this? Obviously plenty of life here, but what's it going to do to your spaceship if you've got landing legs? There's no, no safe place to land here. Or how about if you come down in this place? Where do you look for life here? It's a safe place to land, but where do you look for life? How do you look for life in a place like this that hasn't seen water fall from the sky in years? Or what if you land on a place like this? How would you find life? Where would you look for it? Or what if you landed in this place? I was thinking about the hitchhiker robot that they built to hitchhike across the United States and it landed in Philadelphia, or it went to Philadelphia and got destroyed. Uh, imagine what, what might happen to something that landed in a city like this. Or, you know, given that Earth is more than two-thirds water, what if you landed, this would be a likely place to land. How would you look for life here and what would you take back with you? So this is the kind of challenge that NASA faces when we're going to be sending something to another planet in the solar system or to a moon in the solar system. What do we look for? Where do we land, number one? And then what's the best place to look for the, uh, things that might help us build towards the building blocks of life? And I'm going to talk 
today pretty much about focusing in entirely on our solar system rather than looking from the outside. I know that there's a whole other series of talks we could talk about using radio to search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I'm taking that down to a much uh, more granular level. How do we look for life itself? Not, let's not even worry about trying to find intelligence, but how do we look for life itself in our solar system? And so um, the challenge we have then is that we've got all of these bodies in the solar system where we might look. These are the only places that, that are really accessible to us right now as a species. We can get to any one of these planets in a reasonable amount of time, reasonable being about 10 to 15 years. Uh, and so if we're going to be looking for life, these are the places we look. The question is, obviously, that these are all, if you think about where we came from, these all formed from the same solar nebula. This is the same cloud of gas and dust that contributed to the formation of all of these planets. So we really have a sample size of one. We have Earth and we have its neighbors. We can, you know, we can have learned what to look for when we look for life on Earth. And so we assume that other planets and other moons in the solar system are going to have a similar type of chemistry and things like that that would, that would make us be able to recognize what life looks like. So what do we look for when we look for life? There are th three requirements right now that we know of that, that are necessary for life. And so the first of those is there has to be liquid water. Now, we found uh, life in the Antarctic ice sheets. We found it a mile under ice in, in Greenland. But the, the life is able to convert that frozen water or, or take um, humidity from the air and convert that to liquid water. So you need to have liquid water to act as a solvent and be able to move chemicals around. And so talking about chemistry, there has to be a certain amount of certain types of chemicals, the building blocks that we know of for life, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, other things like phosphorus, potassium, sodium, et cetera. So there has to be the right kind of chemistry around to make life happen. And then finally, there has to be some sort of energy source, something that drives the chemical reaction that's going to take um, uh, reduction or oxidation, that's going to move electrons across an energy barrier. So these are the three things that we see on Earth as being the necessities for life. And what we found, much to uh, science's astonishment, is everywhere these three requirements are met, there is life on Earth. Everywhere we have found all three of these things, we found life on Earth. Life is, is pretty much everywhere around Earth. It's under the ground, it's up in the air, it's in the water, it's all around us. So, you know, that, that's, that's really encouraging if we think about what we start looking for in the rest of the solar system. If we can find these three components, then there is a high likelihood, if it happened on Earth, that it might happen somewhere else. That's our hope, at least. So how do we start then going about looking for the signs of life in other places? Now, the first place that we've been able to actually get material back from is the moon. And so if you remember the Apollo landing, we brought back more than 800 pounds of rocks from the moon in six different landing missions. And we found that there are, we found some trapped water in, in, uh, in glass globules on the, on the moon rocks. We found some organic compounds, but it's not uh, sure whether those were introduced by contamination from handling here on Earth or not. So from what we can tell right now, the moon is devoid of life. We have not found anything that, that points to having those kind of uh, chemical markers that we need to, to make life happen on the moon. Now, there's one other planet that we've actually been able to get a sample from back on Earth, uh, and that's Mars, which is surprising because we have not actually sent a spacecraft to Mars that's been able to bring anything back. This is a, uh, it's called the Allen Hills 84001 meteorite. This was a meteorite that was found on the, um, on the ice in Antarctica in the Allen Hills region in 1984. We know that it came from Mars because of its chemical composition. We think what happened was that a, a large meteor or asteroid crashed into Mars about 17 million years ago. It hit with such a velocity that it kicked up uh, debris that it went past Mars's escape velocity. And so this meteorite was floating around the solar system for about 17 million years. And then 13,000 years ago, it landed in Antarctica and was found sitting on top of the ice, which is actually one of the best places to look for meteorites. So there are actually a number of Mars meteorites that have been found. This was one of the largest ones. And in 1996, a group of scientists um, cut into that with uh, 
you know, uh, slicing through it and then looking at it through an electron microscope, and they saw this very interesting structure on the side here, which, you know, to our eyes looks like a bacterium or something like that. And, and they said this was a, a trace of uh, magnetite that could not be caused by any natural processes that they knew. And so this raised a lot of um, headlines that actually caused uh, President Clinton at one point to have a press conference and say that, you know, we were now starting to see signs of life outside of the Earth. Unfortunately, there are lots of other explanations for what could have caused this. And this is much smaller than an actual bacterium we would find on Earth. This is um, only about uh, 20 nanometers, which is one one-thousandth the width of a human hair. So it's smaller than any other living things that we know of on Earth. So while it looks like it might be something that was alive, we don't have any proof that it actually was. And so the preponderance of evidence goes against this being an evidence of life off of the planet, but there are still people who are still making arguments that this could be. So we've actually did send uh, two landers to Mars back in the 1970s, and in 1976, Vikings 1 and 2 went there with uh, laboratories on board. They had three separate um, experiments on the Viking to look for life in three different ways. And the idea was that if all three of them found markers that indicated life, then you, we had a pretty conclusive proof that there was life on Mars. One of them came back with a definite yes. There is definite signs of, of chemical processes attributable to life. One came back with definitely no, and one came back with inconclusive results. The one that came back with definitely yes, it turned out that there was another explanation for that. There was chemistry. Uh, there were chemicals in the surface of Mars that we didn't know about at the time, perchlorates, which when exposed to the type of radiation and the chemical process that was being done releases the same amount of, uh, of uh, oxygen that was expected from what this would be if it was a life form. So it, it turned out to be a false positive. And in fact, we didn't know that there were perchlorates on the surface of Mars and there's so much of it there actually, it, it probably sterilizes the surface of Mars. And for a long time then, it was, um, uh, you know, we, we, we didn't go back to Mars for almost 20 years after this because of the disappointing results we got back. But Carl Sagan, uh, writing about this, said that life is the hypothesis of last resort. You can only invoke life as an explanation when there's no other way to explain what you see. So whenever anything comes up that, that hopefully says, you know, this looks like a sign of life, you really got to hope, uh, you know, science is going to do everything it possibly can to prove that it might be some other explanation for it. And so every time I see a headline that comes up in the, uh, uh, on the internet, of course, the first thing I want to do is go back and find what the actual research is and see what the other scientists are saying about that, because there are hopeful signs, but then there are lots of other ways to explain what we're actually seeing. So if Mars, you know, Mars was not a, um, a good place to look at first, we look at another planet that's close to us, which is Venus. So Venus is one of our closest neighbors, and you know, it, it, on the surface could look something like, like Earth, but in fact it's an extremely inhospitable environment. The surface reaches 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it's a runaway green, greenhouse effect there. The atmospheric pressure is 92 times the Earth's uh, atmosphere pressure at the surface, so it's the same as if you were a kilometer down in the ocean. And the atmosphere is primarily carbon dioxide. So the surface of Venus is not a good place to, uh, to send even spacecraft because they only survive a few minutes before they completely break down in that harsh environment. But what we did find, and there, there is a, a Venus orbiter right now that's uh, sampling the atmosphere or examining the atmosphere around Venus. And what it's found is that if you go down about 50 kilometers below the top of Venus's clouds, the atmosphere and the pressure are a little bit more similar to what's going on on Earth. And a couple of years ago, the, uh, the Ast Royal Astronomical Society announced that they had found a chemical called phosphine in Venus's atmosphere. And in the past, phosphine has been identified as one of those things that on Earth, the only thing that can produce phosphine is life. We've seen it on Jupiter and Saturn, but under extremely high temperatures and pressures. So we weren't sure, you know, but the, the fact that there was phosphine there was an indication that there, there could possibly be life in the, in the clouds of Venus. Well, it turns out that maybe it wasn't phosphine and it could have been sulfur dioxide that was causing that. And again, other chemical processes might explain that just because we have we know it can't exist on Earth doesn't mean it can't exist somewhere else under a different, uh, different 
process. But Venus still looks like a possibility, and there, there is talk about trying to send probes back to Venus to take a look for uh, signs of life in the atmosphere. So where else do we look? Uh, we've got the um, Jupiter's moons are a, a good possibility. Until the, um, uh, the Voyager missions of the 1980s, we discounted the possibility that there might be other places that life could be other than Venus and Mars in the solar system and the Earth. But then uh, Galileo sent back these, uh, Galileo and Cassini and the Voyager mission sent back these very intriguing photos of the four largest moons of Jupiter. Two of them are actually larger than, the, uh, than our moon. When you have Io, uh, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto as, as four moons there. And uh, there was a, a hint that there might actually even be oceans underneath um, these, uh, some of these worlds. And so we sent back, uh, we did closer study of Europa in particular. It's a very interesting looking surface. It's a very young surface. Normally, if you think about an old surface in, in, the, uh, in the solar system, it's a surface that's got a lot of craters like the moon. The moon is an old surface because there's nothing going on to bury those craters again except more craters forming on top of them. There's only seven large craters on Europa at all. So we think that the surface is somewhere less than 50 million years old, which is very young in solar system terms. And it's got this intriguing uh, dark stuff on it. And uh, in analyzing the spectrum that came back from this, we found out that it's a material that we call tholin, <coughs> excuse me, tholins, which is a class of material that are um, kind of organic, complex organic chemicals. If you think about, I, I don't know if you remember the experiment where they created, uh, where they just took a test tube and put all kinds of basic uh, uh, organic compounds in there, like methane, ethane, carbon dioxide, other th types of things like that, water, put them in, uh, in this flask environment and then just bombarded it with a lot of energy. And what they found was that it created all of these uh, interesting uh, organic types of compounds that were much more complex. And so again, thinking about if these basic materials like methane and ethane and carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide exist out there and you give them enough energy, it creates these complex carbohydrates. And uh, we see this, it, it has this characteristic reddish color, and we see it covering some moons. We saw it on the, the, the uh, dwarf planet uh, Arakoth, which is out in the uh, Kuiper Belt. And so uh, we see it on comets and asteroids and things like that, and it's, it's very clearly on Europa. And one of the uh, uh, recent experiments has shown that Earth organisms can actually take these artificially produced tholins and metabolize those for food. So we've got a potential food source here with the material that's on the surface of Europa. Now something else is going on with Europa, which is um, kind of unusual, it is Jupiter's moons are in what we call an a, a, um, orbital resonance. For every two orbits, or every four orbits that Io goes around, Europa goes around twice, Ganymede goes around once, and then a half an orbit for uh, Callisto, so there, or the three, excuse me, the three inner ones are in the 421 orbital resonance. So what happens there, and you can see the orbits are a little bit elliptical. Europa is the one in blue. And so as it's passing by uh, Io and Ganymede, there's gravitational tidal pulls on it, and it also happens at a time when it gets close to Jupiter. And so this forces the surface of the, uh, of the, of the moon to expand and contract and actually the inside of it gets pulled around too. This is an exaggerated version of what happens to Europa as it goes around Jupiter. And so what happens to Europa's surface as a result of this is you get this really bizarre looking type of landscape, these cracks that form on the surface. These go all over the, all over the, uh, the surface of the moon. And uh, you know, the, uh, the big one that's coming up here uh, the walls of this one are about a thousand feet high. And what we think is happening is that there, there might actually be a possibility that if there is a subsurface open on Euro uh, ocean on Europa, which we believe there is, that some water could get pushed up into that or the contents of some of the ocean could get pushed up into these cracks. And so this was a computer simulation over the course of uh, about a million years of how this process might work eventually as the surface spreads apart, a little bit of the ocean can push up through. So there's a possibility that if there is something inside Europa, it might get pushed up to the surface that we can take a look at. So what would be inside Europa? And 
uh, it, it's a fantastically complex type of environment. What we've determined is that, uh, that the surface of, of Europa is constantly bombarded with radiation, so the, the chances are that nothing could live on the surface there. There's this ice crust, which is about 10 to 15 miles thick. And then there's an ocean that's 40 to 100 miles deep. This is, there's more water in the ocean on Europa than there is in all of the oceans on the Earth combined. So, uh, and then you've got this, this heating of the interior from tidal forces, which could cause things like volcanic vents and plumes and fractures and things. So there's, there's a, a definitely a liquid water environment down there. It's under a lot of pressure. It's, it's cold, but then there is a, an energy source that's down there. So hydrothermal vents is something that caught scientists' attention. And if you remember back from the 1970s, as, as late as the 1970s, we thought that you had to have sunlight to be able to have life on Earth. Everything had to be, su the sunlight was the basic source of energy that drove all life on Earth. But then as we discovered, uh, the, as we started exploring the, the surface of the, uh, the deep, uh, deep parts of the ocean, we started finding these volcanic fissures and vents, and we sent robot probes down to look at those, and we were amazed to find this. So this is, this is in an environment that gets absolutely no sunlight whatsoever. This is 10,000 feet underwater. These uh, plumes that are coming out of there are, is uh, from volcanic vents. The, the temperature there is about 400 degrees Celsius, but it's enough heat to drive the chemistry processes that we're talking about to support life. So you've got this, this very rich biosphere of shrimps and crabs and things like that that are living down there, completely absent, uh, devoid of you know, being able to feed off of plankton or anything like that. So there's a possibility, I'm not saying there are shrimp on Europa, but, but there is a possibility that hydrothermal vents could uh, provide the energy that you need to drive life that far down uh, in that kind of environment. So that's one of the things that NASA is very excited about, is trying to find places that, that might look like that. And so we're going to go back and explore Europa in more detail. We're going to launch the Europa Clipper in 2024, which will make flybys over the surface of Europa. It won't actually land there. Uh, we still have to characterize the surface in more detail. But by flying over the surface multiple times, we'll get a, a better view of what's actually going on there through studying the gravity of, um, of Europa. And if we find that there's enough evidence, we'll find, put together a mission to send back a lander. We have to figure out how we can drill a hole 15 miles deep into the, um, in, into the ice because we've never drilled a hole that deep on Earth yet. So something for us to be thinking about, maybe our grandkids will see uh, the result of that kind of thing happening. So we think Europa is the best place to look in the Jupiter system. It's the easiest one for us to reach because Jupiter is twice as close to us as Saturn. Saturn is the next best place to look for life in the solar system. Its moon Enceladus is one of those. It's a very icy moon. You can see, again, a very young surface. There's not many craters on it. And when we sent the Cassini mission there in 2004, it started studying Enceladus and looking at it and found that it had this very interesting surface, especially down near the South Pole. You see these long gouges in there. They call them tiger stripes because it looked like a tiger just went like that and clawed the surface uh, down at the South Pole. But what really surprised NASA when they went past Europa, excuse me, went past Enceladus and looked back at it in silhouette was we saw these geysers coming out of the South Pole. So there's actual, now we know that there's actual chemical processes or physical processes that are pushing water out from underneath the ice there on Enceladus. And in subsequent flybys of Enceladus, we found that those geysers line up perfectly with the tiger stripes. So those cracks are holes that would lead us into the ocean there in Enceladus. This is uh, a, an artist's depiction of what that might actually look like. And you know, again, this was, this was an astounding uh, finding for scientists when we, when we found this on Enceladus. And they actually were able to retarget Cassini to fly through those plumes and chemically sample them. And in sampling those plumes here, what we found is there is methane, there's water vapor, simple organic chemist, chemicals, carbon monoxide, complex organic chemicals, carbon dioxide. Again, all the building blocks of life that we might be looking for were coming out in the water from that uh, subsurface ocean. So again, we think that the same time that things are going on there in Enceladus that are going on in Europa in terms of having hydrothermal vents down there, uh, there's liquid water, there are organic chemicals, hydrothermal vents, the pH 
is around 8 to 12. Methane is being produced, and uh, there is uh, free hydrogen, or hydrogen molecules that are being uh, detected from the water-rock interaction, so there's chemical energy going down there. One of the scientists I was talking to about this said, they said this, it produces about two pizzas worth of energy every hour. Uh, I've never heard of pizza as being used as a measure of energy, but that, that was a, a way of looking at it. So there is, there is something that could feed life processes down there. Again, Europe, I mean, Enceladus would be a great place to be able to go and explore. The problem is because uh, Saturn is twice as far away from the Earth as Jupiter is, it's going to take us more than twice as long to get there. And then there's the complexity of trying to, to land something there. But this is a very promising area to look. And one of the reasons uh, we, do, we are probably not going to be going to Enceladus right away is because there's even a more promising candidate for life in the Saturn system, and that's the moon Titan. Titan is bigger than the Earth's moon. It's the largest, uh, one of the largest moons in the solar system. It's the only moon in the solar system that has an atmosphere. And it's, it, the atmosphere is a smog, basically. It's very complex carbohydrates. Uh, it's so dense that you can't, penetra you can't see through it in visible light. But Cassini carried some infrared spectrometers to allow them to look below the cloud cover, and this is what, uh, what Cassini saw. Things that appeared to be lakes uh, on, on Titan, we weren't sure what the material was. It was too cold for it to be lakes of water, and we were talking about several hundred degrees below zero. And they weren't quite sure whether this was actually liquid material or not until they took this picture where you've got a sunlight glint off of the reflection of a lake near the North Pole, so they knew this actually was, um, this actually was liquid material. But you've got these lakes of, of ethane and methane, of liquefied ethane and methane. This is a radar picture on the side here, too. You can see it's definitely a flat surface compared to the, to the, um, uh, the other types of, of reflection you're getting around there. So it, they, they appear to be lakes of complex carbon, uh, carbohydrates they are uh, less than tens of meters deep, and we actually see the lakes changing. Uh, during the course of Cassini's mission, we could see the lakes getting larger and smaller. So there was something that was causing them uh, to be enlarged, something that, you know, there were obviously some sort of active process was causing them to, to lose and evaporate uh, material back into the atmosphere. And as Cassini continued to orbit Titan, it went around Titan more than 100 times uh, during its, its mission around Saturn. Uh, you know, we found basically the surface of, of Titan is just covered with organic molecules. And what we think is happening is there's all of this uh, organic material that's in the atmosphere. It gets bombarded by uh, cosmic radiation, and it forms this, uh, this complex photochemical products uh, that, that are being formed in the upper atmosphere. They rain down as methane and other types of, um, other types of precipitation land on the surface, they uh, flow down in channels like, very much like rivers into lakes and then ev eventually evaporate. This is, this is uh, as one of the scientists was explaining to me, they said this is exactly the same as Earth's water process but with different chemical basis because now Titan is smaller than the Earth so the gravity is less but, and, the, and the atmosphere is colder but we're seeing an analog to Earth's water cycle being carried out with methane and ethane on Titan. So again, uh, really the, the building blocks for life are right there on the surface, easy to get to. So again, thick atmosphere that protects it from, uh, from radiation from outside. There's, uh, the, team, the surface is, is teeming with molecules, 10 times as much water, and there's also a subsurface ocean there, 10 times as much water as this Earth. So a great place to look if we can go back there. And so NASA is planning uh, missions to go back to Titan and uh, sample things more, uh, more extensively. These were some of the concepts that were come up, uh, come up with in the, uh, the last round of proposals for a Titan mission. There was a glider, a fly, an airplane that would fly around. There was a balloon mission. One, uh, a friend of mine had worked on the Mare Explorer to actually land a boat in the, uh, in the lakes there and, and uh, float around and sample things. But this um, Dragonfly mission was selected for flight. This is a drone, a nuclear-powered drone. Okay, we're going to send nuclear helicopters to Titan. You know, that's pretty, pretty cool. This thing is about the size of, a, of an SUV, nuclear-powered. Because Titan has a very thick atmosphere and a low gravity, it's a perfect place to send a drone that's, that flies like a helicopter. 
And so this is, uh, this is the way the Titan Dragonfly is going to work. It's going to launch in 2027. It'll arrive at Titan in 2036. It weighs about 1,000 pounds. And so you know, here it's coming down, flying, flying like it does. They're going to first land it near an impact crater and a, a dune field, a dune that's covered with organic material. But then after it lands, it can sample the surface, do the analysis it needs to do, and then take off and fly another five miles to more locations. So this will be able to hop and, and uh, surface, uh, explore the surface in lots of different environments on uh, Titan. So this is probably our next best place to look other than, excuse me for this, next best, best place to be looking for, um, for life right now. That, that this is the next mission that's going to help us be looking for that. It's the Titan Dragonfly. I, I do hope I'm around in 2036 to see the results of this coming back. I wish, that you wish we would, somebody would come up with warp drive so we could get things out in the outer solar system a lot faster. But uh, that's, that's where we're going to be looking next. And again, now the Perseverance rover that's on Mars right now is also collecting samples that are going to be packaged and ready for a mission which has not yet been designed to somehow land on Mars and bring those samples back. Uh, the chances are... It, what we, if, if Elon Musk has his way, he's going to have humans there on Mars faster than we're able to design a robotic mission to, uh, and I'll be talking about this at one of my next lectures on, uh, on commercial space colonization. But, uh, so there's a, there's a chance, a very good chance that within the next 10 to 15 years we'll be bringing back samples from Mars and being able to, to detect what's going on on Mars directly. We have the sample mission going on at, uh, at Titan, and so there is is, is hope for doing this kind of exploration in the near future within our solar system. Again, what we can, what we can reach. And so, again, going back to this picture, we've got the sample size of one. These are the, these are the places we can explore. Uh, you know, we'll continue to look at the ones that look most promising, but, you know, the, the question comes up then, of course, is, you know, where else might we look for life outside of, of the Earth. And as I mentioned the other day, we've discovered thousands of exoplanets now in the last uh, 25, 30 years. And so we're, we're characterizing ones that look like they might be uh, potentially good places to look for life. And one of these is a system called TRAPPIST-1, which is a, a red dwarf star, which is 40 light years away from Earth. There are seven planets going around it. And if you, to scale here, these are the seven planets around its sun. But as you can see on the bottom down there, the actual orbit is very small, much smaller than the orbit of Mercury. But because their, small is very, uh, their sun is very small and very cool, the habitable zone is much smaller around TRAPPIST-1. But we've been able to detect these seven planets that are in that zone around there. The, so this is, you know, people have asked me, what's the James Webb Space Telescope going to do that Hubble has not been able to do? And one of the things that it, that it can do is to actually sample uh, through spectroscopes, can, it can determine if these planets have atmospheres and can actually tell us what chemicals are in the atmospheres of those planets. This is a, just an amazing and astounding technology that's coming up. We look at, when we watch, uh, one of the ways we determine if there's planets around a star is we can see the starlight get dimmer as a, as a planet goes in front of it. And with the spectrometers on, uh, on the James Webb Space Telescope, what we'll be able to do is look at uh, the size, the relative size of how much of that starlight is being blocked by these planets, uh, by these moon, yeah, these planets, because as uh, what happens is, if uh, a certain chemical is present in that planet's atmosphere, it will absorb more light in that in a particular uh, side of the spectrum, and so as we see the apparent size of that planet get bigger or smaller, this one here we know has uh, molecular hydrogen, sodium, and potassium by looking at this this. Uh, this uh, example here. And so we'll be able to tell what the James Webb Space Telescope will be able to get some sort of characterization of what chemicals are actually in the atmosphere. And that will tell us, you know, if we start seeing things that look like they only can be produced by mechanical processes. Uh, for example, you know, even one of the uh, unusual things about Earth is that Earth's oxygen level is not natural to the planet. Our oxygen level was created by bacteria back early in the planet's history. And so we have an unnatural uh, 
amount of oxygen in the atmosphere that would not naturally occur in normal evolution of the planet. So if we found another planet that had a large proportion of oxygen like we have here on Earth, that would be a sign of life on that planet. So this is, uh, this is something that's going to be coming up. Uh, James Webb will be launched on the 22nd of this month, and it will start uh, its exploration around the middle, middle of, the next, uh, of next year's summer. So uh, people are very, very excited to find out what kind of things are going to be coming back from James Webb, because this uh, could be a very easy way for us to find out if there's potentially life outside the solar system. And uh, I was looking at the latest, uh, or the last month's issue of Sky and Telescope magazine about the future of astronomy. Uh, their prediction was that we would definitely have, we would have detected life outside the solar system by the end of this century. And I hope it's going to be before that. I hope it'll be during my lifetime. I think it would just be a fantastic thing for us to find out. So keep, uh, keep tuned for sure. This is going to be very interesting. But of course, it goes back to the big question for, for all of us is, you know, what happens if we find life or if we don't find life? What does that tell us about, you know, I was talking about yesterday about the, uh, the, the change in how we look at ourselves from the Earth being the center of the universe to suddenly now being just one of many planets that are going around the sun and the sun being just one of billions of stars that are in the galaxy and the galaxy being just one of billions of galaxies out there in the universe. What does it mean to us if we do find life and if we, or if we don't find life. And I was uh, thinking about a Star Trek Next Generation episode I saw before I left here. There was one where uh, the Enterprise has, has been orbiting a planet that is about to begin space flight, and they've had observers down on the planet, and the, the chancellor, the ruler of that planet, suddenly discovers that Starfleet has been down there. And he, uh, the chancellor said, this morning I was the leader of the universe as I know it, and this afternoon I'm only a voice in a chorus. So again, that's, if we start thinking about ourselves as being not the only place in the universe that has life, now we realize that there is this larger chorus, and what does it mean to our perception of ourselves, our place in the universe, and, uh, and creation in general? You know, what, is, what is out there, how, you know, and what does it mean for, for uh, how the universe itself has evolved? There's all kinds of philosophical questions that come from that, and, uh, just, just wonderful things to think about. But as um, Arthur C. Clarke said, there's also the other possibility that either we're alone in the universe or that we're not, and either, either one of those uh, prospects is equally terrifying. If it turns out, proving that, we, that there is no other life anywhere else is going to be impossible to do. You, you know, proving something doesn't exist is very hard. But uh, you know, if we keep searching for it and we don't find it, you know, what does that say for us and our models about uh, uh, you know about who, and who we who we are. A gentleman asked me a question yesterday. Is like he was, was talking about how uh, how profound it is that we just happen to have the right you know, we have the right size sun, we have the right size planet, we have the moon that protects us or you know, creates the tides that keep us from um, you know that that help promote life on Earth. We've got all of these things that make it possible to have life on Earth. How inf is it infinitesimally small that we have those markers that allow life to form here on Earth? Or you know, are there other ways that life could form? Could life form with silicon instead of carbon? We don't know. Carbon is probably the easiest thing for life to form with because it takes less energy than it does to, to do things with, with silicon. And um, you know, nature tends to like things that take le less energy, but it doesn't mean it couldn't happen. And so you know, if there was silicon-based life out there, what would it look like? There's all kinds of questions that we need to be thinking about and pondering our place in the universe. And uh, I'll go back to this one last picture. This is, this is a picture of the Earth and the Moon, by the way, taken by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. So this was a picture of the Earth taken from Mars. Uh, and again, just thinking about, you know, what will we find? Imagine when we get telescopes that are powerful enough to see another planet that looks like that. What's that going to tell us? And is there a possibility we could ever reach out and communicate with those people? Do we want to communicate with those people? Are they going to be benign? Or are they going to be um, malevolent? We don't know. But there's lots of decisions that are going to be made depending on what we find out in the next couple of years. Again, some good, uh, good discussions to have over some beverages at some point. And uh, I wish I had more answers to give you, but that's what we're actually doing right now to look for life within our solar system. 
Uh, we do have the continued search for extraterrestrial life with radio telescopes, but I think this is going to provide us with more direct evidence than we may find with the radio telescope search. And so I've come to the end of this, uh, this presentation, and I'll be glad to meet with you out in the hallway afterwards if you'd like to talk about any of this or any time around the ship, please feel free to uh, stop me and, uh, and talk to me. And I, again, encourage you to come up to the sky above us uh, talks that we're doing in the planetarium. We had full houses for both shows yesterday. There'll be three tomorrow. Uh, just go to uh, guest services, and they can sign you up for that. So thanks for coming, ladies and gentlemen.